After two more minor roles at Fox, Ethel quickly headed back to Broadway, where her hunger for stardom was fed with a Cole Porter smash. The body musical, Do Barry Was a Lady, co-starring Burt Lahr. Porter and Merman followed it with another hit, 1940's Panama Hattie. But for the first time, Ethel's personal life was headed toward disaster. She had fallen deeply in love with Sherman Billingsley, the married owner of New York's Stork Club. She was convinced that Billingsley would divorce and marry her. But when the millionaire's wife became pregnant, a stunned Ethel ended the relationship. Ethel once told me that she was not happy when she was in love. She didn't like to be in love because she was always afraid she was going to get hurt. Devastated over her breakup with Billingsley, Ethel rebounded with her first impulsive trip to the altar. The star had known Hollywood agent Bill Smith for only a few weeks when they married hastily in November of 1940 between the matinee and evening performances of Panama Hattie. There were those urges to be the good wife and be taken care of. So she was looking for a man that she could marry and have a family, be the good wife, and maybe also have a career. But within hours of the ceremony, Ethel realized her marriage to a near stranger was a foolish mistake. Two months later, the pair agreed to an amicable divorce. But Ethel soon plunged into another, more intense relationship, this time with newspaper manager Robert Levitt, a protege of William Randolph Hearst. The handsome, gruff Levitt hated musicals, but he was fascinated by the colorful Ethel, who found herself passionately in love. In the fall of 1941, the singer took her second walk down the aisle. But this time, the bride was pregnant. And in July of 1942, the newlywed gave birth to a baby girl, whom she named Ethel Junior. She was thrilled to be a mom. It was the culmination of something that she had wanted for a long time. But although she claimed she'd take a year off from Broadway, Ethel grew impatient with life at home. She returned to the stage for Cole Porter's World War II-themed hit, Something for the Boys. Boy, look at those drumsticks. How'd you like a kick in the teeth with one of those drumsticks? <laughs> and I'll bet she can do it. How do you like that? And this is the womanhood I'm fighting to protect. And this is the womanhood I'm fighting to protect. After 13 years of success, Ethel now had as much power as any actress on Broadway. And the tough, self-protective star was not afraid to use it. On something for the boys, she had cast member Paula Lawrence fired for allegedly upstaging her. But though Merman fought to protect her turf, she also befriended young talent, like her understudy Betty Garrett. I'll tell you, she'd spit in your eye if she didn't like you, but I think she liked me. She got sick once, and uh, I was notified at 5 o'clock in the afternoon that I was going on. She would call me in, in the intermission and say, How you doing, kid? And I said, Oh, Ethel, I'm nervous. And she said, Listen. If they could do it better than you, they'd be on stage and you'd be in the audience. <laughs> Ethel didn't have a nerve in her body when she stepped in front of an audience. The nerves were manifested differently. Everything had to be perfect. If she wasn't feeling things were going to go well, she could be hell on wheels. And that's, I think, where her nerves came out. In 1945, Ethel followed something for the boys with a more personal production, a son named Robert, after his father. But even as Ethel recovered in the hospital, she was being pitched another starring role on Broadway, a musical based on the life of Western sharpshooter Annie Oakley. Annie Get Your Gun boasted stellar talent, from its producers Richard Rogers and Oscar Hammerstein to its composer Irving Berlin. Included in the score was a tune that Berlin almost dropped, one that became Ethel's signature song. There's no business like show business like no business I know. Everything about it To is me, amazing. that show was as close to being perfect as any show could possibly be. Uh, I'll never forget the outrageous take she did when she sees Frank Butler when she goes, 
And I thought nobody in the world would get away with that except Ethel. She was fantastic in that show. Annie Get Your Gun became the greatest triumph of Merman's career so far. It ran over 1,100 performances, three years. But away from the stage, the queen of Broadway was increasingly miserable over another disintegrating marriage. Her work hours and her fame frustrated Robert Levitt, who began to drink. Their home became a battlefield, and in 1951, their rocky 10-year marriage ended in divorce. The greatest disappointment of Ethel's life, I think, was the fact that she had lost Bob Levitt. She regretted it as long as she lived. But if the new decade of the 1950s found Merman's second marriage in ruins, it would also give Ethel a long sought after triumph, success as a Hollywood star. You're watching Ethel Merman on Biography. In 1950, at age 42, Ethel Merman followed the phenomenon of Annie Get Your Gun with another Irving Berlin stage hit. Call Me Madam was loosely based on the life of Pearl Mesta, the gregarious U.S. ambassador to Luxembourg. But its driving force was Ethel Merman, the hostess with the mostess, who made critics cheer, playing a blunt ambassador who finds romance in Europe. 20th Century Fox bought the movie rights, and for the first time, an ecstatic Ethel recreated one of her stage performances faithfully on film, opposite George Sanders and Donald O'Connor. Ken, what's happened to you? I hear singing, and there's no one there. I smell blossoms, and the trees are bare. Anyway, get down to the part. She comes in. You don't need analyzing, and the ear went. It was like a snare drum. You don't need analyzing. It is not so surprising that you feel very strange, but nice. And she was right there. <laughs> uh, well, it was beautiful, but you couldn't hear it for four or five days. Put your head on my shoulder. You need someone who's older, a rough down. Velvet there is nothing you can take to relieve that pleasant ache. You're not sick, you're just in love. You don't I need analyzing. No it's not so surprising that I you feel very strange but nice. God goes in a pattern. I know just what's the I matter. Why. Because I've been there I once or twice. Put your head on my shoulder, sleep need someone who's older, I'll rub down with a velvet cloud. There is Our nothing you can take to relieve that pleasant ache. You're not sick, you're just in love. To Ethel's delight, Call Me Madam was a hit. At last, she had headlined in a Hollywood success. And at its premiere, the star celebrated with the new man in her life, Robert Six, the wealthy president of Continental Airlines. Again, the singer was swept off her feet by a tall millionaire. And in 1953, Ethel became Mrs. Robert Six. She soon announced that she was through with Broadway and moved with her children, 11-year-old Ethel and 8-year-old Bob, to Six's palatial home near Denver, Colorado. But for the lifelong New Yorker, it would not be an easy transition. She convinced herself that she could be the docile, you know, wife of the 50s. And then the real personality would come out. And I think that was a real struggle for her because it, those two things at that time really couldn't be reconciled. Ethel may have sworn off Broadway, but she was eager to build on the movie success of Call Me Madam. Fox prepared a follow-up once again featuring songs by Irving Berlin. The result was the big budget extravaganza, There's No Business Like Show Business. Ethel portrayed an overbearing but loving stage mom, whose family was played by Donald O'Connor, 
Dan Daly, and Mitzi Gaynor. Bob, a man now coming home like... You're drowning me. Don't put any ideas in my head. Yeah, but I... Down, boy, down. When I was going to do uh, There's No Business Like Show Business, she walked into the room, the one and only Miss Ethel Merman, and she proceeded to tell me the dirtiest story I have ever heard in my life. I cannot, of course. This is a family show. I cannot, and I can't even use any gestures, but I fell on the floor, and we became best friends. Be anything you can do, we can do better. We can do anything better than you. One day, the phone rang, and the voice said, Methala, do you want to have dinner with the Windsors tonight? So that night, we had dinner with the Duke and Duchess of Windsor. Everybody's dancing, and the Duke and Duchess are just sitting there, and Ethel's about to get, get up and dance with somebody, and she said, Hey, Duke, get off your ass and dance with your wife. And he did. <laughs> Pablo, Chico, Miguelito. Ethel's most notorious co-star in the film was Fox's number one bombshell, Marilyn Monroe. The sex goddess played Merman's foe on screen, and proved a real-life source of constant irritation. Oh, this kid and I have just got to wind up the best of chums. With Marilyn, she had this phobia. I told everybody about it, that uh, she was afraid to get in front of the camera. She was scared to death. If we were doing a scene together, she would make Ethel wait, and you don't make Miss Merman wait. Walter, Walter, where's the blonde? And um, then Marilyn would come in all kind of dewy and kind of starry-eyed and, and, oh, I'm so sorry that I'm, I'm all, I am just was a little confused about where to go and what, what to do. And Ethel looks at me like, what is this kind of routine? Mom, I think you owe Vicky an apology. What? This isn't my idea, Mrs. Donahue. No, it isn't. It's mine. I think it's high time you two got things straightened out. Oh, so that's the plot. Apparently my daughter... You are my daughter, aren't you, Mrs. Gibbs? I think so. Apparently, my daughter has the idea that you and I ought to be friends. Do you mind if I ask her what she thinks we have in common? The film allowed Ethel to sing a stellar array of Irving Berlin songs. But to her disappointment, it opened to mixed reviews and failed to ignite Ethel's struggling film career. By the late 1950s, Ethel was frustrated with her husband's frequent work trips which raised suspicion in her jealous mind. She also grew regretful about her divorce from Robert Levitt. So it came as a shocking blow in 1958 when Levitt, the father of her two children, committed suicide with an overdose of pills. His death really affected her deeply. She went through a period of intense regret about uh, the fact that she, they were not able to make the marriage work. But for Ethel, Robert Levitt's act of self-destruction was only the first in a series of spiraling tragedies to come. For the web's best bios, log on to Biography. In 1958, Ethel Merman returned to Broadway with a role that would be her most personally rewarding. Gypsy was based on the life of stripper Gypsy Rose Lee, but the show's focus was Lee's Mama Rose, the ultimate controlling stage mother. During the show's intense rehearsal, Ethel was exhilarated by the challenge of the most complex acting part she'd ever tackled. I had a dream, a dream about you, baby. It's gonna come true, baby. They think that we're through. 